Yeah, the laws of thermodynamics, like you said, I mean, they are some of the most fundamental laws of the universe. They are universal, they're invariants, they're, they apply everywhere. And by the way, that's a very key point that I want people to keep in mind. And they were created by God. And so everything in the universe must obey and adhere to these laws of thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is simply that. It's the study of the movement. Dynamics means movement. It's the movement of heat energy, that's what that means. So it deals with the transfer of energy from one place or form to another. And so basically these laws just describe the relationships uh, between various forms of energy and how they affect matter. And the key concept there is that heat is a form of energy corresponding to um, a definite amount of work. Welcome to the Creation Today Show, where we bring together interviews with experts and solid Bible teaching your host, Eric Hovind, affirms the ultimate authority of God's Word, the truth of creation, and why it matters to you. Well, it turns out God knew naturalism was going to be a thing. So he configured the most fundamental laws of science in a way that naturalism would be D-O-A, dead on arrival. Hey guys, welcome to the Creation Today Show. I'm your host, Eric Hoven. Today we have rocket scientist Webb joining us to discuss these, kind of these pesky little laws that atheists and naturalistic evolutionists and people like that just, just can't seem to overcome. Now, Master Master Webb, he, he has two master's degrees. I mean, what else are you going to call a guy with two master's degrees, right? Master Master Webb worked in the guidance, navigation, and control department for several different interplanetary programs for NASA. I think that's really cool. Master Master Webb was the lead navigation engineer for the NASA programs, such as the Park Solar Probe. That's the one that sent the mission to like touch the sun. I wonder how close they really got. We're going to have to ask him about that. Uh, and the uh, International Space Station commercial resupply missions in 2001. Rocket Rob. Oh, that's another good name. I like that. Rocket Rob. Uh, he's a rocket scientist. His name is Rob. So he moved his family to northern Kentucky to work with answers in Genesis. So here's an apologist, uh, a science writer, and a co-host of Answers News. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Master Master Rocket Rob Webb. Hey, Rob, welcome to the Creation Today Show, sir. Great to be back with you, man. Yeah, oh, Rocket Rob, so that's what they glad. call me. That's a pretty clever, catchy name, I thought. So that's, uh, oh, come yeah, on. And, and, and usually people just call me that rocket rocket guy. They usually don't even know my name. They're like, oh, you're just that rocket dude that works at <laughs> Answers of Genesis. And, yeah. We got to change it from that rocket guy to Rocket Rob or uh, something. I thought for sure, like so Ken loves nicknames. I mean, he's one of those leaders that loves nicknames. He's not, he hasn't Rocket robbed you yet. No, that's what they call me. They call me Rocket Rob. And so, oh, they but, do. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's what they call me. That's my nickname. <laughs> but uh, people don't always remember my name. So they just call me that rocket guy. They're like, oh, I saw you, that rocket guy that was on the TV and whatever. So it's okay. Oh, that's I'm fantastic. getting that. <laughs> well, welcome to that, back to the Creation Today show, man. I got to ask, uh, what's better? Working at NASA? I mean, because I got to say, that's, maybe it's just my imagination. That seems really cool, but it may be just it's kind of boring and laborsome to just kind of work on that stuff. Or is it like, so what's better creation apologetics or NASA? Like, like what's it like? It's hard to say. It's really two different categories here. Um, I definitely love uh, aerospace engineering. I love rockets. I love space exploration, but I also love God's word. I love biblical apologetics. I love equipping, um, giving answers to help defend the faith and and helping God's people. Really, that's what it's all about. Um, and that's ultimately my goal. Uh, my goal is to try to go out and, and help other Christians, equip them with the answers, and also to preach the gospel. That's my number one goal. And uh, I've actually not been a Christian my whole life. I became a Christian back in uh, 2012, about, uh, was it 12 years ago now, about a year after getting into the industry. And um, I mean, long story short, I mean, it's... Uh, everything changed for me. So it, it's just been great ever since. So well, I have a feeling your uh, impact, your outreach. Uh, well, okay. That's hard to say. I guess your outreach used to go to the sun and now your outreach goes to eternity. Is that kind of how we should that's look right. at it? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. Yep. <laughs> so you worked on one of the missions that I, I remember seeing the, 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 the news, uh, uh, news articles come out back when we sent a probe that, you know, quote, touch the sun. Okay. How close did we really get to the sun, like when you yeah. say 
Parker Solar Probe. That's uh, that's a mission launched back in 2018. So I was the navigation engineer for the third stage. Usually uh, we had two stage for this rocket. We had to give an extra third stage to give it that extra boost to go into the heliocentric orbit it had to get into. And at closest approach, Parker Solar Probe is going to get within about 3.9 million miles from the sun. Um, now that sounds like a big distance, right? 3.9 million miles. But uh, if you remember how many miles the Earth is from the sun on average, do you remember that number, yeah, Eric? Like about 93 no million, right? 93 million miles. So it's going to get within about 4% of that distance. So it's the closest object we ever had to the sun. Um, we call it the first mission to touch the sun. It didn't actually touch it. It just went into the upper atmosphere of the sun called the corona, uh, trying to understand all the solar uh, energy uh, particles, the solar winds and all that. And, uh, and what makes it so cool, though, is that it is also the fastest man-made object we've ever created. It's moving at the, at the speed of 125 miles per second, right? So that's not miles per hour, but miles per what? second. <laughs> so oh pretty fast. Um, so, I mean, imagine just going from LA to New York at that speed. Wouldn't that be nice, right? Uh, oh, yeah, take yeah, you yeah, like, yeah. what, 20 seconds to get there? If you could survive the trip, I don't think you could, but <laughs> <laughs> it's not here nor there. But uh, yeah, pretty fun program to be part of. Yeah, make sure you guys like, uh, just keep tabs on that. I believe it's going to make its closest final approach coming up next year in 2025. Now, out of curiosity, do you happen to remember what kind of temperatures you, the, the probe is having to deal with that close to the sun? Yeah, so on average, it's going to get within about 3,000 degrees. Definitely hotter than your oven um, is the temperatures. And I was a navigation guy, but I had some uh, some friends on the thermal team, and those guys told me that they could get the spacecraft down to about 80, maybe 85 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's 85 degrees on the cool side, 3,000 degrees on the hot side. So pretty amazing engineering went into it, um, for sure. That is incredible. Wow. All of that to send a little bitty thing to the sun mm -hmm. to tell us that the sun evolved by chance. Is that kind of what they're... <laughs> Pretty that... much what they have. I mean, sadly, that's how it is with NASA today. They are inundated by the evolutionary naturalistic worldview, and that's their goal. Uh, but obviously, as Christians, as those who stand on God's word as our authority, um, it's great that we're exploring God's creation in the heavens. Remember, God created the sun. He created the sun on day four of creation to be the greater light. And so um, as Christians, we should actually be excited for missions like this. We're, we're understanding more about God's creation in the heavens. It's part of really of our dominion mandate to learn more about and and just to be in awe of the glory of God. And so that's that's how I look at it, at least as a Christian. That's actually a better approach than I have, because sometimes I just get frustrated. I'm like, why are we spending all this money just to try to prove evolution? And in reality, we are gathering data. They're just interpreting it through the evolution lens, and we're interpreting it through the creation lens. So I guess the data is what we're getting, and that's what's that's what's really neat. Mm -hmm. Yep, oh. yep, exactly. You got it, man. Well, good. I'm uh, I'm learning, man. I'm like, you're you're teaching me here. Okay, so I want to get into today these, I don't know, I think of them as these pesky little laws, like, the, but yet these are the most fundamental laws in, from what I understand, all of mm -hmm. science called thermodynamics. I, I, I don't know, I kind of want to say, okay, Rocket Rob, teach us, man. <laughs> Master, yeah. Master Web, what do we need to learn today, my friend? I like that. I think I'm going to keep going with that. Master, Master Web, Master, Master <laughs> Rocket Rob. That's what I'll go with from now on. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> um, oh, and your your degrees are in aerospace, right? That's what yep, you're aerospace degree. engineering. I, I got a master's degree in astrodynamics and a master's degree in satellite navigation. So those are the two uh, little fancy terms there. But anyways, yeah, thermodynamics. And, oh, and, and hang go on. Ahead. I did notice you've got um, what some people would call an ungodly item right behind your right there yeah that one yep. right there <laughs> you you got a round globe there i'm sure we're gonna have somebody on I the do. program say you got that wrong rocket rob are you wrong about that I am not. No, and it's actually uh, me and Dr. Danny Faulkner, our resident astronomer. Uh, we actually, um, I think it was about a year ago, we did a whole six-part series called Flatline. If you guys want to check it out, go on to our Creation Museum YouTube channel. Uh, we did a live program where we got we got to actually cover a lot of the biblical as well as the scientific uh, arguments and refutations that you hear about all the time. And so it, it's just so sad because I meet more and more Christians on a weekly basis um, at the Creation Museum as well as the Ark Encounter that are really starting to buy into this flat earth myth i mean it just blows my mind that more and more churches and christians today it's it's interesting i was actually talking to danny about it it seems like it's starting to go down in the atheistic uh communities but we've been seeing an 
increase in the amount of flat earthers within Christian circles. So um, again, it's, it's just so, it, it's so important for Christians that, that we go out there, we get the answers that we need. And so speaking of that, uh, Danny has a great resource if anyone wants to look into it uh, called Falling Flat. You can get it on our bookstore um, on our website and actually it answers a lot of the most common questions regarding the flat earth myth and, and all the other uh, nonsense basically that they kind of promote. But sorry to derail uh, us a little bit there, but I, I'm like, it's, I'm uh, so tempted to just say, let's just yeah, go that direction. But no, yeah, thermodynamics. No, thermodynamics. Let's, 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 let's get back to it. So, um, yeah, the laws of thermodynamics, like you said, I mean, they are some of the most fundamental laws of the universe. They are universal. They're invariants. They're, they apply everywhere. And by the way, that's a very key point that I want people to keep in mind. And they were created by God. Um, and so everything in the universe must obey and adhere to these laws of thermodynamics. And so maybe this is the first time you're hearing this, you're thinking thermo, what? Like, what is this thermodynamics you're talking about? Don't worry, it's not rocket science, or maybe it is. <laughs> um, usually in my industry, we have to say it's not brain surgery because brain surgery seems kind of hard. Um, but rocket science actually is, isn't that bad. But oh, in a awesome. nutshell, thermodynamics is simply that. It's the study of the movement, dynamics meets movement, it's the movement of heat energy. That's what that means. So it deals with the transfer of energy from one place or form to another. And so basically, these laws just describe the relationships uh, between various forms of energy and how they affect matter. And the key concept there is that heat is a form of energy corresponding to um, a definite amount of work. That's kind of the more technical definition. And I went and with usually in physics, when we say work, that doesn't mean like your nine to five job. In physics, work means a measure of energy transfer. So anytime you hear that, that's essentially what that means. And so I think most people have heard of at least the first and the second law of thermodynamics, but most people don't know that there's actually four uh, fundamental laws of thermodynamics. And so the first one is something that they call the zero with law. Um, sometimes it's called the fourth law because it was actually recognized after the other three laws were accepted. And they the, call like it the zero, zero law. as in the number zero. Yeah, the zero, right. zero with law. law. I know it just it cracks me up. Um, us physicists weren't we're not very creative. And so zero with <laughs> law, and they, they call it that because it's the most fundamental of all the four laws. In a nutshell, basically just uh kind of lays out the concept of temperature and thermal equilibrium. And so uh basically it states that whenever you have two systems that are in equilibrium with a third system, then they are in equilibrium with each other. Uh it seems almost too basic, right? But it's actually very essential to the laws of thermodynamics, which then leads to the first law. Um, and so the zeroth law and the first law, they kind of go together. Uh, the first law states that whenever energy passes into or out of a system, uh, it's the internal energy, uh, the fancy word there is called enthalpy of the system, changes in accordance with the law of conservation of energy. And you're thinking, what in the world does that mean? Well, in simpler yeah. terms, um, I think most people are familiar. It's just that matter and energy can neither be created nor destroyed. I think most people have probably heard that the conservation of energy but it can only be converted into one in, into one another in an isolated system. It's very important you specify it's in, in an isolated system where matter and energy cannot enter or leave the system. And so practically speaking, what that means is that there can never be an increase or a decrease in the total energy that exists in the universe. Now, we'll circle back to that in a moment. Um, and I, I should also mention, too, that... Um, since the early uh, 20th century, we've actually known that energy and mass are equivalent, and so each one can be converted into one another. Uh, per Einstein's famous equation, I'm sure most people have heard of E equals mc squared, uh, where E equals energy, m is mass, and c is the speed of light, which actually means that the universe has a tremendous amount of energy if you just take a step back and look at it. And so that's kind of in a nutshell, the zeroth and the first law. Uh, the second and third law are a little bit different. They deal with a concept called entropy. Um, not enthalpy, but entropy here. Uh, that's basically a measure of disorder in the system. Or um, I, I, I like the way that uh, Dr. Jason Lau, uh, to kind of borrow his term, he says entropy is kind of like the messed upness of the universe. You can kind of think about it that way. It's all the, the okay. messed upness of everything that's happening. And so the second law basically says that. We can measure this? Yes. We can measure how messed up we are? Yeah, so it's 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 a measure of disorder, I guess you can say. And the second law states that in an isolated system, the sum of the entropies of these, uh, basically these interacting thermodynamic systems never decreases, or simply put, entropy never decreases. That's an easy way to remember it. So practically speaking, that means uh, heat doesn't spontaneously pass from a colder body to a warmer body. It's always the other way around, right? A warm body to a cold body. So for example, uh, the example I like to use is whenever my cold wife, uh, whenever she likes to cuddle up next to me on the couch, uh, she doesn't get colder and I get warmer. It's the other way around. I get colder and she gets warmer. And so that's kind of the uh, second law in motion there. 
And so what over is it time, about those feet, man, those feet are I know. always cold. How the hands that? and the feet, especially the when you're laying feet. in, especially when you're laying in bed too. It's like that's like the worst when you're laying in bed. All of a sudden, you feel like that ice cold, like like <laughs> wakes you up. And, <laughs> oh man! But um, and so over time, because of that reason, energy becomes less useful. And so entropy, a way you can think about it is it's basically a way to describe how unuseful energy is and what makes energy useful is that gradient that difference between uh two different things two different uh locations the energy dif differences uh, which by the way is how engines work and why engines eventually wear out over time and so over time these energy gradients these differences will decrease and so which means energy becomes less useful over time uh to do work to basically to, to do more work and that's why we see things rust and that's why we see it, uh, engines eventually go out and so simply put more entropy means less useful energy that's kind of the the takeaway there and then finally the third law basically states that entropy um uh entropy of a system approaches a constant value um as the temperature approaches absolute zero which is the lowest limit of temperature there so uh so i think kind of the takeaway here is entropy of an isolated system never decreases and that means the universe as a whole is continually running down uh moving from order to disorder because entropy of the universe must increase with time and by the way there are no known exceptions this is a universal law where the amount of useful energy is always continually decreasing now also just to quickly clarify too there's a lot of misconceptions among christian circles today that um you know because we're, we're talking about disorder we're talking about things running down and so a lot of people think entropy uh maybe it came around as a, as a result of the curse or, or or the result of the fall i just real quick want to clarify that point not all aspects of entry are necessarily bad there's actually um, a lot of good purposes for entropy for example um it allows us to digest food so we can take food and turn it into energy for our bodies um um, it also provides friction on the ground so we don't just slide down hills. Uh, there's uh, basically how we breathe air going from high to low pressures. Even the heating of the earth from the sun, uh, it depends on entropy as well. So there's a lot of good um, purposes. I think that's the kind of the takeaway there for entropy. So entropy was really uh, was created by God during creation week, during those first few days. Nice. So we have these fundamental laws. Okay, the zeroth law, equilibrium. If two things are equal, so if one uh two things are in equilibrium uh and one of those is is in equilibrium with another then all three will be in equilibrium which seems if a is a, and a and a are match if there's another a it's going to match it seems pretty yeah with a and b are in equilibrium then okay. when it's in touch with with a c then they're all in equilibrium that, that's essentially what with, with the law states there yeah okay and then the first one that's the one that i i've always looked at going if matter can't be created or destroyed, we've got to answer the question, where did matter come from? Where did energy come from? That's right. And, and now I remember learning this in school thinking, but I can destroy matter, man. I've watched a house burn down. I've been in a campfire. I've watched the wood get destroyed. And they had to explain to me, no, that changed its form. That's what thermodynamics is. You've simply gone from wood to heat. Is that a right way to state that? Yeah, like a really simplistic example I like to use with my kids is whenever we're camping, we're roasting marshmallows, you think about um, just that transfer of energy. So it starts off from the sun, the sun gives off sunlight in the form of heat and light. And so the wood will receive that energy and then create all these bonds within the wood. And then we, once we burn the wood, it breaks all those bonds and then releases that energy, uh, with, which then gets transferred to your marshmallow, which then, you know, uh, heats it up. And then you eat the marshmallow, then turns that into energy for or your uh, so you can run around and, and jump on things and all sorts of stuff so and so throughout that whole very simplified example you basically the the point is you just see energy transferring from one point to the other uh energy is never being created or destroyed in that whole scenario and so that's that's kind of the key point and most people if you just look take a look back and just think big picture take a step back um you'll actually see that there's a contradiction between these laws and scientists have actually known about this contradiction for a very long time ever since the laws of thermodynamics were really established if you extrapolate that both to the past uh basically you're saying that while energy is conserved right the total energy of the universe doesn't change it becomes less useful over time now because we live in a universe created by god who is transcendent over creation there's obviously no contradiction so we can have both sets of laws operating simultaneously today uh, obviously it's not a problem for an all-powerful god um, he's the one that upholds the universe by the word of his power and plus when we start with god's word we know from the beginning genesis 1 
God, he created matter when he made the heavens and the earth. Um, and then he also made uh, energy when he made light. And then matter and energy we know is no longer being created today uh, after God said that he rested on the seventh day. So that's why we're not seeing matter uh, all of a sudden coming into existence anymore after that seventh day of creation. But if you take a step back and just look at it, and it really does present a huge problem for the naturalistic worldview. Those who reject God and hold to a form of naturalism where everything is just natural law, uh, you know, it's just time and chance acting on matter over time. It really puts them into a major dilemma. And so kind of the bottom line here is the first law of thermodynamics, it, it essentially demands that the universe be eternal because you can't create matter out of nothing. Well, right. the second law of thermodynamics demands that the universe cannot be eternal, right? So you see that contradiction. And so for a long time, uh, scientists actually thought that the universe was eternal. It always existed. Uh, so that was a way for them to basically avoid that problem of having to create new energy, which would have violated the first law of thermodynamics. But remember the second law, that everything given enough time, all the energy of the universe will eventually become not useful, right? And so the scientists actually call this the heat death, they say, and in so-called billions of years from now, everything will, uh, the entropy will reach this maximum state, and so there will be no more useful energy left. And, and obviously, if the universe was eternal... We would have already been at that point. There should have been ample, plenty of enough time to actually reach that maximum state. And obviously, uh, things are still working. We still have work as possible. Um, you know, life is still possible, of course. And so the universe cannot be eternal. And so, again, they're, they're back to this contradiction. Well, which one is it? You know, right? we, we can't have both. You can't, what is it, have your cake and eat it too kind of, kind of situation there. So. so if we go back in time, the first law says it cannot be eternal. The second law says it can't be eternal. First law says it can't have a beginning, or it has to have a beginning because yeah, it can't the first be law sure. demands that the universe be eternal, right? Because you can't create the energy. The second law of thermodynamics demands that you cannot; it cannot be eternal. Otherwise, everything, all of the useful energy would be gone, right? Life would be uh, impossible. You wouldn't be able to have engines. Biological systems wouldn't work. Um, and so they're really caught in this dilemma here. And science has actually known this, about this for a while, and they've been struggling trying to come up with an explanation. And in case you guys are wondering, uh, how do you resolve this problem? I'm glad you asked. Um, <laughs> they come up with all sorts of different rescuing devices. I mean, you just look online, look at some of the papers that they have. Uh, they got all sorts of different fairy tales and appeals to imagination to try to solve this problem. We probably, we obviously don't have time to go through all of those. Uh, I, I would say the most common belief, though, for most scientists is that the universe did have a beginning. So the universe is not eternal. So now all of a sudden they have to deal with, well, how do we create energy from nothing? That's really their their main issue. Um, going back to the Big Bang story. I, I, by the way, I call it the story, not a theory, because like theories that, require yeah evidence um and so really the big bang is more of an idea or more of a story uh 13.8 billion of years ago uh but again that whole story of the big bang would violate the first law of thermodynamics and so they come up with all sorts of unverifiable speculative ideas and how the universe could have come into existence without violating that conservation of energy uh they got weird interpretations of quantum mechanics fluctuations and all sorts of different stuff but no evidence by the way at all the back up any of their claims. Um, and so really, I think the obvious answer is that the origin of the universe was not a natural event, right? It was, it's really, it's beyond the realm of science because it was a supernatural event created by our all-powerful God. But of course, those Christian, those scientists who, who are not Christians, um, who subscribe to the religion of naturalism, they'll refuse to believe that, right? So they would rather contradict science. They'd rather contradict the laws of thermodynamics than to contradict their religious beliefs of naturalism, which really shows at the end of the day that this is not a knowledge issue. It's not an evidence issue. Really, it's a heart issue. It's a spiritual issue. Um, they have an axe to grind, and they're at war with their God because if they abandon their naturalistic beliefs of the Big Bang, then the only alternative is creation, which uh, obviously is that's not, that's not something that they want. Okay, so you just went do 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 all the way to a conclusion. I've got some people I think that are going, hang on, thermo what? So why, some of you are going to have to rewind this and listen to this again, but I want to kind of go forward with even more explanation. So you got it's not rocket science. Saying it's not rocket science, Eric. It's all right. It's easy. <laughs> some okay, so you got to understand the first law saying matter should be eternal because you can't create it and you can't destroy it. That's right. So from a naturalistic worldview, no God creating it, you now have an eternal universe. Second law saying everything is eventually going to uh, come to a heat death, which means the usable energy that we do have, all the matter and energy at some point, it'll get to the place of 
equilibrium where you no longer have heat to transfer and do work or energy to transfer and do work to something else. And so once everything's even, given enough time, everything in the universe will go down to an evenness across it. And then no work can take place because you don't have heat from the sun to give to the plants to grow into wood, to, to, to use that energy or to have food to eat, to create that energy. Eventually you get to no more usable energy. That's kind that's of right. the dilemma, right? Yeah, pretty much. Yep, that's the contradiction. That's the dilemma that they have to deal with. And, and so then you it, said, so so that means, and you, you kind of went, man, that was a cool little series there. You're like, doo -doo -doo -doo, that means this, that means this, that means this. That means if if there's no usable energy left, and the first law means it has to be eternal, we have a contradiction. And you're saying the naturalist has no real way to fix this contradiction and only inserting the God of the Bible, the one who is outside of nature, the one who says, I will hold these things together. I will create things in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. Only by inserting a God to start the process of matter and energy can you overcome this contradiction. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, essentially what they have before them, they have two different options. They can either stop, they can either start with God's word. They can start by saying that there was a creator that created everything or they can contradict the laws of thermodynamics. They have to contradict science in order to come up with their, their story, in order for their story to even work. And so obviously because they're at war with God, right? They're rebels against God. They'd rather contradict science all day long, right? And so it, I mean, it just shows what Romans 1 says, that they would just, they'd rather believe in anything as long as it's not the God of the Bible. And for a long time, I was in the NASA industry for about 10 years. And this is what I had to deal with time and time again with all of my colleagues. And even when I was in university, I mean, um, it's it's just, it, it really is inundated by the evolutionary worldview. We see it all around us, left, right, and center. And so really, well, that, that is their that dilemma. There are going to be some atheists watching, some naturalists watching that go, huh? Wait a minute. And I'm, I'm telling you, go back and listen to that again and listen to the, the, the progress from these two cannot go together unless you insert God and then all the way to where we would be today, heat and death. Therefore, you must invoke God. I, I should have written down those steps because you went through them. So it was a really cool step-by-step -step <laughs> thing um, showing that basically if you don't start with a Christian worldview, you can't think the way – you can't have the laws that we have today That's is right. really where you ended up, right? That's right. Yeah, they're and, and they're trying to use these laws that are, again, like I mentioned in the very beginning of the show, they're invariant. They're unchanging and they apply everywhere. It's very important that we remember those three things. And so I know some some atheists will go back and say, well, maybe the laws of thermodynamics didn't apply at the very beginning of the universe. Okay. But you start okay, going well, say, down that say, road. Save that. I want to okay. talk about that yep. right after we, we unfortunately, I'm out of time. I have to let social media and our television program uh, go right now. Hey, Facebook, YouTube, uh, podcast listeners and television audience. Thank you for tuning in. I'm going to continue the conversation with Master Master Rocket Rob uh, in, on the other side of this. If you want to watch the rest of this, come on over to creationtoday.org. You can partner with us and, and watch not only the rest of this, but every episode that we've ever done with all of our amazing guests. Uh, if you want to get a hold of Rob's work and his resources and his articles, go to answersingenesis.org, answersingenesis.org. He's also got videos on their Answers TV platform, Answers. Is it Answers.tv? I think it is. Yep. Answers. Answers.tv. Thank you for that yeah. plug. Yep. So please go check that out and sign up for Answers TV. You will get equipped with lots of great information just like this. If you're a skeptic and you're like, huh? Rewind, play, go check out his, uh, his resources on AnswersInGenesis.org or come to creationtoday.org and let's get on the other side of this break and let's actually understand this in a powerful way. God bless yeah, you guys. Everything I just week. mentioned, yeah, like you said, yeah. everything I just mentioned is on our website. People can, can really look at those steps a little bit more in detail and have the words in front of them. Next week, guys, I've got a great show for you. We are talking about the existence of the very foundation of the Christian worldview, Jesus Christ himself. Did Jesus actually exist? What's the evidence? We've got cold case homicide detective Jay Warner Wallace joining us. You're not going to miss next week, Wednesday at noon. God bless you guys. I'll see you then.